Damaskar. Um, this is my first time in Nepal and I feel very blessed for this opportunity to speak with all of you today. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for bringing me out and I'm going to be sharing with you a few of my favorite things about CSS layouts and how Firefox DevTools can sort of help us understand it a bit better. Um, I promised Pushpa that I would not go over 25 minutes, uh, but we will see. We will see how this goes. Uh, so I might talk a bit fast, so if you have any questions, feel free to come and ask me later. I'll be around. Uh, I also have a few stickers with me, uh, if stickers are your thing. So uh, this is the title of my talk. Um, I'm a, my name is Hui Jing. I'm a developer advocate with a company called Nexmo. And, uh, that's the emojis just represent who I am uh, as a person. So let, let's quickly get started. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, Flexbox. So may I know how many people here actually do like CSS, they build layouts, they have to do like use Flexbox and things. So have, has anybody used Flexbox? That's great. Um, so I think when I first started using Flexbox, it was uh, very confusing because everything that I tried to size was not the size, it was not the correct size. So um, what Firefox is really useful for, in a recent, I think, 66 onwards, there's this thing called a Flexbox Inspector. So we can actually toggle it if you click on the Flex uh, tag or if you toggle it from this icon. So what it does is that it shows you a number of things and you go to the Layouts tab so I'm using Firefox today. You can go to the Layout tab, and it tells you a lot of things. It tells you, it first shows you the outline of each of your individual Flex items. It also shows you how much free space you have, because Flexbox is one of those layout things that sort of lets you distribute free space as well. So free space is kind of important. Uh, so it also shows you the Flex direction. So it's a bit small, I'm gonna read it out. In the Layout tab, it'll tell you the flex direction, which is now row. You can also, an alternative direction is column. It also shows you the wrap status, so the default is no wrap. And more importantly, what it can show you is what the browser actually does to your flex item when you kind of size it, because you don't have full control over the flex item sometimes, right? So one thing to note is that the recommendation suggests that we use keywords. So there are a number of keywords um, that come with Flexbox. So there's like initial, none, auto, and a positive integer. They basically cover a lot of the typical use cases for Flexbox. And the specification authors suggest that you use these keywords because they will correctly reset uh, the, other, the other properties. Because Flex is a shorthand that consists of Flex Growth, Flex Shrink, and Flex Basis. So when you use these keywords, you will reset, correctly reset uh, all three of these values. But anyway, the first thing that uh, I really want to cover is sort of to, to talk about what happens when you actually do display flex, right? And, and I think what's interesting with using flex and with the other, um, how should we put it, layout methods that we used to have, like we use display block, we use inline block, we use floats, and then we sort of um, have to force our items to, to, to be a certain size. The difference is that now the browser takes over a lot of the calculations that we used to do by hand. Like we used to have fixed layouts and we say, oh, this thing is 100 pixels. And, and your browser will say, okay, sure, 100 pixels. But the thing is that if you put a value of 100 pixels for a flex basis, for example, I think a lot of people, when they first start out, they expect, okay, I put 100 pixels, so it should be 100 pixels. But that's actually not the case because the flex basis is not the actual width of your item. What it is, it's the starting point in which the browser will calculate the ending, the ending size. So depending on how you set your flex grow and your flex shrink, your end, your end size may not necessarily be 100 pixels. So Flexbox is a lot of the interplay between these three properties of flex grow, flex shrink, and flex basis. Right, so in the first example that I want to talk through here, I have, again, it's a bit small. Hang on, let's see if I can zoom this. Yeah, so this is the first example that I have. So I have two sort of sets of content. Both of these are flex, uh, very, very basic flex containers in that if I highlight it, both of them have the uh, display set to flex and nothing else. 
So when you set a display flex on a container, all of its children automatically become flex items. And if you don't explicitly say, uh, set flex properties on the children, uh, they will default. They will default to a flex value of zero. So the flex grow will be zero, meaning if there is extra space, it's not gonna grow. The default flex shrink value is one. So the moment there isn't enough space, items will all start to shrink at the same rate. And the default flex basis is auto. And that's pretty important, and I'll talk a bit more about this. But if you look here, you'll see that the first two columns have the same... Oh, I should not shake. Let's just step back. Um, the first two columns have the same content. It's, the first one says word. It's not me. <laughs> um, the second one says this is a sentence. The only difference is the third, the third column, right? So the first, the first set has like really, really short content. Oh yeah, this is a short sentence. And the second one has a lot of text. So if you notice, I mentioned, right, both of them have the same properties, but they behave very differently. And the reason is, the reason is the fact that, okay, now I unzoom, when the browser starts to grow and shrink things. So, like I mentioned before, if there is extra space, at this point, because the flex grow is zero, when there's extra space, the items are not going to grow. But because there is a flex shrink of one, what this means is that the moment there isn't enough space, items are going to start shrinking. So at this point, lots of space. The moment it hits this point, there's not enough space for the second set, second container. So everything starts to shrink. So that is why at this point in time, when I showed the initial example, you'll notice that this is a sentence has already probably sh shrunk about 60%. But the first set of content hasn't even started shrinking yet. And this is the reason why if you have uh, a page layout with different types of content, different sizes of content, and you set the same values, you realize that my second row and my first row somehow don't look the same, and then your designer starts to complain, and then your product manager starts to complain, I don't know why, this is why. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is good to, this is a good thing to, to sort of keep in mind when you're using Flexbox. I think once you understand this, you'll be able to better troubleshoot like any of these sort of funny things that happen. So earlier on, I talked a lot about flex basis, right? So this second example is, is uh, I'm using this to demonstrate the difference between flex basis of auto and a flex basis of zero. So they almost, it almost seems as if zero and auto, they should be the same thing. No, they are not the same thing. Um, so for this second set of, uh, this second example, again, both of them are flex containers. And now for this case, what I've done is that for each of the three flex children, I've set different flex grow item, uh, different flex grow factors on them. So the first one has a flex grow factor of one, second one has a flex grow factor of two, and the last one has a flex grow factor of zero. And now the basis is that, the difference is that the, for the first, first set, it is with the flex basis set to auto, while the second set has the flex basis set to zero, and you can already see that there's actually a big difference. So I'm going to unzoom this a bit so it's more obvious. So when we when we do flex, and when there's extra space, and we have a flex growth factor of one or two or whatever, what it's doing, what the browser is doing is, it's actually distributing free space. It's not really explicitly saying that, um, oh, this, this item needs to be twice the size of its, uh, its sibling or, or three times the size. It's about free space. So what do I mean? Content takes up space. And um, if you think about it, just, just, just remember that like, for content is a priority. So you can't, so you, you can't shrink space that content needs to take up, right? So this is sort of like compulsory space. But if there is extra space on the page, that's what gets, that, that is what gets distributed. So for in the first line, at this point in time, give me one unit of free space, there is an extra bit of space here, and there's more space here. And if you look, if you use the DevTools, the DevTools is actually explaining what's going on. So if I can turn your attention to this part of the page, I'm just going to pull this out a bit more. So what the DevTools can tell us now is that it can tell you the content size. And I'm reading it out, it's about 406, uh, 246 pixels. That's how much space the, the, the sentence, give me one unit of free space needs. And the browser also tells you that your flex item was set to grow, and it tells you how much it grew it by. So for this particular case, at this particular size, your item grew by 60 pixels, so your ending size is 306. If I highlight the next one, which has a growth factor of two, 
if you look at it, the content size about 250 something, but the grow, because the factor was two, you'll notice that the browser now tells you that, oh yeah, I grew. I grew this item by 120, which is twice the amount of free space that you gave the first item. So that's what happens when you set a flex basis to auto. It takes into account the content size and then distributes any free space according to the factor of flex grow that you set on it. Right? So your final size is 378. So if you think about it, 378 is not twice of 306. That's because, again, I'm just reiterating this point, is that what is being distributed here is free space and not the actual space of the entire flex item. But in the event you do want a, a, a scenario where one item is twice the width of another, that is where setting a flex basis of zero uh, comes in handy. So when I highlight this second one, you'll see, I've set a flex basis of zero. So what, when you set a flex basis of zero, you're actually telling the browser that don't count the content size. Like, I don't care how many words are in there, start counting sizing from the amount of free space available. So in, if you look at the DevTools, and this is this actually to me, the reason why I, I'm, I'm giving this talk is that I didn't understand it until I saw this explained in a diagrammatic format with numbers. Because like when you read the spec, it's all words, and you did a lot of words. And I don't, I don't, you say this is English, but not really, because I don't understand it. But when, when, when I see this, when I see this, when, when I see this, in the dev tools with numbers and calculations, it clicked for me and hope, I, I'm hoping it'll click for you also. So for this second uh, set of content, right? Content size zero. You immediately, the browser just says, yeah, I, I grew, I grew, I ignored the content, but I gave you uh, about 300 pixels of space. And if you look at the second one, it's 600. So it's double because it kind of ignores the content size when it does the calculation. So depending on the use case that your design calls for. Uh, keeping this in mind, when you're using Flexbox, the flex basis will affect the sizing of your, um, the end sizing of your layout. And depending on what you want, you'd want to use the appropriate flex basis value uh, accordingly. Yeah. Uh, another good thing about display flex, uh, flex layout and grid layouts actually, is that they give us the ability to use uh, box alignment properties, which I find much uh, makes it very convenient to align things uh, along a, a vertical axis. Because I think everybody's favorite front-end problem and joke is that, oh, it's impossible to align things uh, vertically. Um, but with, with Flexbox and with box alignment, it's actually a lot easier now. So again, if you use the Flexbox inspector, what's useful about it is it kind of gives you a way of visualizing how the free space is distributed. So there are about there are six box alignment properties. Not all of them are uh, applicable to, to flex flex. Uh, so you can use four. So I'm just going to briefly run through what we have. The first, I think, uh, pretty commonly used one is justify content. And what it does, what's helpful about DevTools is that if you can't remember the keyword values, there's auto complete. So you can sort of like just, I mean, you can just scroll and until you find the one you want. And like, oh yeah, yeah, actually, I wanted that one, which is great. Um, but what justify content does, it moves the entire block. So all your flex items are like a block, and then it moves it either left or right. With, if you use start, center, and end, it's, it's going to move it along the uh, main axis. But what's nice about box alignment is that it also helps you distribute free space. So the whole set that has space uh, prepended, you, you can adjust depending on how you want your end result to look like. So if you look at the last, uh, the last row, it's easier to see. You have space around, whereby the space at the, the two ends is half of that between, because the space between each flex item is equal. If you don't like that effect, you can go with space between, where there's no, like at the end, it just kisses the side. That's an option. And there's also space evenly, where all the items, all the free space is distributed equally uh, amongst uh, the, the, the spaces between your items. So you have options. You have options on how you want to lay out your items. I think that's pretty useful. Um, another way, another thing you can do with box alignment in Flex is that there's, you, if you have a container that is, let's say, much bigger than what your, your items are. So in this example, it seems that all my Flex items are the same height, but that's actually not, that's not their original size. So the moment I add a flex items property, you'll see that this is the original size of all my items. 
So the default align items value when you set a display flex on a container is that it's, it's going to make all your items stretch along the cross axis. So if if you if you had explicitly said I'm like uh, say. The second item, the one that's two, is supposed to be more than double of one the height. But if you use flex, it's like it's all going to be the same height. And if you're confused about that, this is why. It's because the default value for aligned items is stretch. So if you want to adjust it, as long as there's a value that is not stretched for aligned items, it's going to go back to its original height. And you can align items again with the same keyword value, start, center, and end. And, um, what's interesting is that there's also a value called baseline. So if like, in my example, I have different sizes, different heights, uh, different font sizes, and you want all the text to line up in, uh, evenly so it's easier to read. You can actually use this value called baseline, which I don't think uh, a lot of people have heard of. And, and the last thing that is good about flex is that you have something called align content. So this is more applicable when you have a container that is a lot, again, a lot longer uh, than the height of your item, so I'm going to push it high. So when you have a container that is a lot longer than the, the height of your items, you're going to have these weird gaps in between. So sometimes you're okay with it, most of the times your designer is like, what is this weird gap? Like, get rid of it. So the one way to, to sort of get rid of this uh, weird extra space is to use align content because what it does is it lets you pack, it lets you pack all your items together and align them within your container. So these, again, I think these are, are alignment properties that let us control the free space within a container much more easily than if you were using, uh, say, display block or floats. Floats is worse. Floats is that you float something and then suddenly your parent has no height and then you have to clear the float, but then you clear the wrong direction and it's just a mess. I think this may feel complicated, at first, but I think once you're familiarized with it, you'll start to realize like you cannot unsee, you cannot go back to using the old methods anymore because this actually becomes a lot more convenient. Yeah, so there are a few there are a few use cases uh, for Flexbox that I like to use it. So sort of like a selling, like if I'm a salesperson trying to sell Flexbox, this is my one of my favorite examples is auto margins is your friend, right? So in the past when we tried to, we could we can always you know, align something center using margin, uh, margin left zero, margin right zero, uh, no. Margin left auto, margin right auto. But when you try to do top and bottom, it doesn't work. Guess what? For flexbox, yes, it does. Just one line, boom, everything in the center. Uh, this is, to me, this is like my uh, number one selling point. Uh, a second selling point I think is a bit more practical is that I find this design pattern very often. Like you have a, you have a header, you have a nav navigation bar. Um, and then you have a bunch of links because the navigation bar. But you always have this one lonely link that's always on the other side. Um, depends if you're writing on a left to right language, for example. You'll be the one on the on the very right. Usually it's like log in, register, sign out. And normally, if you I think in the past you want to do this, you do like float left, float right. And then when you float it, then you're like, oh, your designer your designer says, hey, it's not aligned. Like can you can you align everything center? We are like no. <laughs> and because. Because it, it's fine if your, your items is short, but then your, your content team will be like, oh, oh, we have this new product, and, uh, but uh, it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a four, four name. It's so awesome that we need four words to name it. So like, can you make it fit in the header? We're like, like no, but, but, don't, but yeah, now, the answer now is, actually now you can say yes. Uh, whether you want to say yes or not, I'll leave it up to you, but like, technically, now you are allowed to say yes. So what we can do is, again, it's an auto margins thing. So what you can do is for, for the last item, you, you can just do a margin left auto, and you will kick it all the way to the, to the, to the side. So what this, what, what this means is that you can make use of the box alignment properties that I talked about earlier when it comes to like aligning top, center, or end, and, and, and use that with Flexbox to sort of do, create this very, very common, uh, I would say, this is a design, design pattern that's very common for those of us who are building a lot of products these days. Uh, another pretty good use case is for cut style layouts because at least in these few years, I think it's like cut style layouts are very popular. I mean, I, I feel that they started out with e-commerce, which makes sense because you need you need an image, and then your image needs like you need to talk about the image, and then your you have a like product description, whatever, and then like a buy now button, like oh yeah, sure, great. And then somehow the news 
the news website like, hey, that's a great pattern, we should do that too. We could like have a have a feature image and then we can have a title and then we can like read more. But like it's a, it's an annoying pattern because <laughs> but we have to build it because that's what we are paid for. I think the problem is that when the when the designer gives us the design, they use Laura Mixer, they use the same number of words, they use the same title, and the image is always the same size. But when the actual content editors put in the, 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 the blurb, it's not. Like you have like some 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 like today is very boring, so I only have like three lines. But some like oh I'm I'm, I'm very excited like five lines, and then you start having this 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 like floating call to action buttons because like there's not enough. Can you can can you write more words or like can you can you cut words that and your content editor is like no, please my art. And like so it's okay it's okay now I'm like you can indulge their art by using Flexbox. So what we can do now is that we can make use of the Flex Grow property. So if you look at a markup, I have a card. So my card is my Flex container. And now my content is a Flex child and the call to action button is also a Flex child. So what I can do is on my content, I just say Flex 1. So what it does, it sets the growth factor to 1. And regardless of how much content it is, because when you set a dis you, when you use a display flex on a on a on a container, again I say all the heights end up the same. So you solve that problem that all your cards are already the same height. But within the flex item itself, so if you look at the markup here, you'll notice that it's a double flex. So the outside is a flex container, and each card is also a flex container. So the point I'm trying to make is that don't be afraid to nest. You can keep nesting. There's no limit. You can flex, you can display flex within a display flex within a display flex. It's not, your, your browser will not explode. Okay, the, the flashing on the screen has nothing to do with flex. Uh, it's more of a wire issue, okay? Um, yeah, so, 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 so again, if you need everything the same height, I suggest using display flex to solve because it takes into, it, it takes into account, you will, you will take the, the height of the card that is, has the most content and everyone else will just match it. So that's, that's also one thing. And to solve the floating CTA problem, you can use a flex grow to make sure that no matter how, how much or how little content there is, your button will always kiss the bottom of your card. So again, I think this is a pretty good uh, selling point for flex. I'm not sure enough, I have enough time to move on, but we're going to talk about grid because I cannot talk about layout without talking about grid. Um, so has anybody actually used uh, grid before? I think it's less because it's newer, right? Okay, a handful. So I uh, take this as my sort of a, a sales pitch for grid this time. Like, I feel like a salesman today. Anyway, uh, so again, Firefox is a very good uh, grid inspector, which really helps in understanding what grid is. So for Flexbox, right? Flex usually works best in a single dimension, meaning like, if all your items are in one row, it's great. If all your items are a column, that's also great. But there's no actual row or column. So if you want your items to sort of know the position of each sibling in a grid, you can't do that with flex, but you can do it with grid. So what you can, the, the syntax for grid, I really like the, the actual syntax. And I don't think a lot of people can say that about CSS properties, but I think for grid it's really nice because if you look at the, the actual code itself, it's very visual. So the, you, you first do a display grid, and then you sort of define the rows and, uh, rows and columns on the grid. You use grid template columns, and when they are... So if you see here in this first example, right? Uh, zoom, 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 zoom. In this first example, grid template columns, it's three values. And three values means three columns. If you look at grid template rows, I have two values. And two values mean two rows. So for someone like me, I, I feel like I'm a more visual person. This, this is very helpful for me, because I can sort of like visualize what I write in code and what, what shows up on the browser. So that's, that's the basic syntax uh, for grid. And by default, grid is going to lay out all the... All, so similar concept to flex, when you apply display grid on a container, all its children become grid items. And then the browser is going to lay them out like in, a def, in the default uh, writing direction. So in this particular example, if I expand, you see that, okay, I have a grid, I have six items, I have a three by two, so it's laid out A, B, C, D, E, F. Very basic. But that's very common. Like even without grid, we could always lay out items one after another. Nothing special. What's special about grid is that it makes it very easy to manually place items in a vertical direction. So um, earlier in the day, there was a check, like a chessboard example. I just like co continue the theme. I don't know if anyone else has a chess example. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Uh, so this is uh, sort of a chessboard, so to speak. So if you look at the grid, I'm going to highlight it. 
Inside, I have three grid items. So each of them is a, is a pawn emoji. So by default, by default, it should, they will all end up like one, two, three at the top. But be, if I want to shift them down, without grid, if I wanted to shift this, these pawns like to the bottom of the container or to the middle, you probably have to do something like absolute positioning. And yeah, it might work, but the thing about absolute positioning is that it relies very heavily on your values. So either you do a lot of maths to get your percentage right, or you be lazy and then you just chuck in a fixed value, but the moment your user starts to resize, you're like, eh, I don't think the chess piece works if it's between two squares, but okay. Um, but the thing about, so the thing about grid is that it lets you build response, position things wherever you want, and still work if you have a responsive design, which is most designs these days. So now the syntax is like, it's like doing maths. So it's like x, y coordinates on a Cartesian plane. So if I'm going to highlight the second one, I just say grid row two, uh, grid column two. So this is where having a tool like the grid inspector, which tells you the line numbers is very, uh, very useful. Because even though this example is like three by three, very simple, some of the more complicated layouts uh, and, and designs your designers might give you, if you're, maybe if you're doing editorial or you just have a bigger page, you may go up to like 15, 20 columns. So you're not gonna sit there and just like count, like oh, one, two, one in item eight. No, you've got better things to do in your life. So to have, to have this, to have it seen immediately, you're like, oh, I know that I need to place something in line eight. And it also makes it easier to troubleshoot because sometimes uh, the, the way grid works is that it's, it's not index zero. So your, your, first, uh, your first grid line starts one. Uh, I think some people are like, no, it should start zero. Eh, life. So sometimes you may put in the wrong number, right? So having a grid inspector that shows you the line numbers is very helpful for troubleshooting as well. Um, so I mentioned something called responsive design earlier, and I don't know how many of you have worked in agencies before, but I used to work in an agency and I had to build like e-commerce for, for a lot of products, and my designer would be like, oh yeah, boss said, boss said we need to do responsive design. So in my mind, right, I want, on a very big screen, I want six, I want six, five, four, three, two, one. I'm like, no. <laughs> like, no. Because in the past, in order to do that, you had to write a lot of media queries. So for every, for like, for every viewport, if you wanted to change, then I would negotiate, I'm like, cannot, I, we, need, we need to be mathematically inclined. So give me like either multiples of two or multiples of three. Like, I can do six, three, one, that's fine. Or I can do like four, two, one. And they're like, why? I'm like, because maths. <laughs> no, it's because media queries. I'm just very lazy to explain. Um, but the thing about grid is that it actually does allow you to do this Six five four three two one thing without media queries because there's this uh, there's this property that you can use that it's called uh, auto fill. So these are keywords. There are two keywords here: auto fill and auto fit. Uh, they behave very similarly, but the, the difference is that if there is free space. <laughs> Should I move my finger slower? <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. So the difference between autofill and autofit is that if you have autofill, it's gonna respect any free space available. So in this code, right, I need I wanted a minimum size of six M's for all my columns. But there is extra space. When I put a value of autofill, the browser is gonna keep the extra free space available for any additional items that might come in. But if you're like, I don't actually need it. Uh, I would like, if there is free space for my items to grow, then you change the value to auto fit. So what it does is that even though uh, you, you set your items to be 6Ms at first, if there's extra space, it's going to be bigger than 6Ms because auto fit just means that fit all the items into any available space. So you have a few options here. But what I want to show is this particular example, in that this is like, again, so seven. So if I use the, the syntax that, that I talked through just now, this is actually possible. I can go like, because what, what happens now is that my browser is doing all the calculation for me. Instead of me having to manually go and calculate like, oh yeah, okay, if I wanted six columns, it's like 100% divided by six at this particular viewport, and I have to put it in a media query and do like six different media queries. 
there's no media queries involved here because the browser knows how big it is and the browser knows how big you want your columns to be and the browser can do the calculation for you. Because let's be honest, let's be real, some of you might be really good at maths, I'm not so good at maths, but either way, neither of us are as good as maths as the browser, right? <laughs> so let the browser do the work for you is my point here. Yeah. The next example that I'm going to talk about that grid can do is that grid lets you name your grid areas. So this is more applicable for layouts that take up the whole page. So usually there are a lot of things on it. Um, so think, think like magazine designs. I think a lot of people who used to work in graphic design, I think they were disappointed when graphic design like, was, was moved to the web because there were a lot of really nice layouts that you could do in print, but you kind of couldn't do on the web because of technical limitation, because it was so hard to do layout. But I think gradually, it's now possible, and it's now even possible to make the web layouts even more interesting than a print layout because the web is, is dynamic, right? You can change the size, and what, as you change the size, you can actually change your layout. What's most interesting about modern CSS layouts these days is that you can use the same code base and have your users see a different design depending on whatever screen they are using. So one of the things that is really useful uh, when it comes to grid is that you can actually name the areas. So if you use the, again, if you use the grid inspector, uh, okay, hang on, there's a three grid limit. So let's turn this off, turn this on. So what you can do is you can actually name areas. So just now I talked about line numbers, which is great, uh, but sometimes it's just easier because if you, are, you have elements on your page that take up multiple cells, it's probably easier to just name the whole uh, section a name, and then you just assign your grid item to that um, particular section. So what makes, this, what, what makes this good is that if you have multiple breakpoints, and let's say you have a design that is three different layouts for three sizes, you don't actually have to go into your grid item code at all. So what you have done is, uh, I'm just going to talk it through, right? You have your grid, and you have different sections of your grid, and you give them names. And for the grid item code, you just assign them to their respective sections. So when you need to change the layout, you don't have to touch the grid item code anymore. So if you have 20 grid items, that's fine. You assign once and leave it alone, and all the changes that you need to do, you only do on your grid itself. So I'm going to show the code here. It looks very, it looks very, very, very it looks a bit complicated because in DevTools, it kind of squishes everything together. But what you can do is that, so if I explain the code, grid template areas is also a very visual syntax in that you will have each row is represented by values within code marks. And each set of code marks is a row. And within each, within each row is a grid column. So you have to match. So my grid here, it's a six by six. So I have to have six columns for each row. And what you can do in your code, not here, but in your code, is you can sort of align it all together. Use a monospace font, then it'll, it'll look better. Um, so in this case, I have, I have like a nine cell apple section, a four cell banana section, and a six cell cherry section at the bottom. So I, can, I don't have to change the grid item code. If I want banana, for example, to take up less space, I can just change the grid template areas code directly. So we're gonna try this. And just by changing the grid template areas code, I can change the size of my grid item on the grid. Um, yeah, so again, uh, if you have a mismatch number of rows and columns, then the whole, the, whole, the whole piece of code is ignored. So that's why just now when I was typing, in the midway of typing, it, it, it goes off. So this is just the only thing that you need to take note of is that you kind of have to not mismatch things. But if you, like I said, you format your code in a visual format, usually this is not going to happen. So this is, a, this is a very simplified example. An actual more practical example would be something like this. So again, it's a bit small. Um, but this is sort of like a, a, a typical layout where I have, I, have a, I have an article header, it's called green tea, then I have some text, I have an image of it. So I've assigned each of these elements. I have a title, you know, I have content, I have an image section, I have a navigation section. That's at the, that's, that's at the widest viewport, right? But like, if I have a more narrow viewport, what I can do is that, okay, I want to adjust things around. So again, like I mentioned, if I'm going to highlight the code, I'm going to bring this back. So this is the, 
So the way I do it is I do the smallest first. So I do like, my default code is, is smaller, so it's, it's cancelled off. What, what, you get, what you can see is here. So at a, at a relatively larger screen size, this is how my columns look like. If it hits the, the breakpoint, it changes again. And if I hit the most narrow, the most narrow breakpoint, it calls the. It's gone. Oh yeah, I don't have. I don't actually have to use grid at all. So this is a non non grid fallback. So what? So what? what what's good about this is that, again, you 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 don't have to search through like all your in like this 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 example. I only had six items. But imagine if you had a more complicated design with more items. You're not really going to sit there and go and adjust each, each grid item position individually at each breakpoint. You can do all the changes um, at the grid level. And I think that's a, a really interesting uh, part of grid that I really encourage everybody to go and explore. Um, I have no idea what time I'm given because nobody flashed any signs at me. Um, <laughs> Which is, which is very kind of all of you. Uh, yes, I, I see the sign now, I should wrap up. So I am going to wrap up. Uh, so my closing, and this is be a thing that I started doing uh, earlier when I gave this talk before. Because, so because, because of time constraints, there are a lot of things I couldn't cover. Uh, so you can come talk to me about them if, if you have any use cases. But what I want to encourage everybody is to, is to give it a try. Because I think some people are like, oh yeah, it's new, it's very complicated, so many numbers, very I don't want to do. I'm like, no, no, give it a try. Like, so, 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 uh, what I suggest is that you jump right in because the journey will be smoother than you expect it to be. Thank you very much.